Well, good afternoon. Uh, let me introduce myself first of all. My name is Jen Charteris. Um, my day job, I'm the exec director of an organisation called Crosslands, which provides um, theological training and resources for people who want to stay in their context as they train uh, for ministry and for people who are in uh, sort of vocational marketplace kind of day jobs and want some sort of theological training. So it's a brilliant thing to do. Um, I've only been doing it for the last four years, and prior to that, I spent uh, nearly 30 years in management consulting, which is really um, a big part of what I'm drawing on uh, here as we talk about partnerships this, this afternoon. Um, my particular specialism by the time I got to the end of that 30 years was working on strategic alliances and joint ventures, mainly with the UK government and some of its big um, kind of corporate suppliers and things. So I kind of know more about how you build um, aircraft carriers than theology, how to run a theological institution. But I'm learning and, and we're getting there. We have, actually, we're having a great time. Um, but uh, yeah, just a, just a joy to be able to be with here, you here this afternoon. We're quite a small group. And just to say, I'm really happy, in fact, at my happiest, um, if we turn this into a little bit of a conversation. So I've got lots of material to work through, but I'm really happy to pick up on dialogue as we go through this particular thing we come to and you've got a burning question. Uh, let's, let's, let's pick it up uh, as, as, we go, as we go through. Um, uh, let me just give you a little bit of a sense of where we're going with this, um, uh, we're, what, what, what we're aiming to cover. Uh, is just a, just a bit of a, a kind of biblical context uh, for, for partnership. Um, we'll think a little bit about the strategic decision to partner or not to partner. Uh, most of the time we'll spend on what it takes to make it work, uh, in particular focusing on uh, what healthy partnership looks like, the kind of joint relationship, um, which is a kind of thing in itself. Um, and then we might have time to get onto some particular leadership qualities that I think uh, become important, uh, particularly important when we find ourselves leading uh, partnered um, projects and entities and, and so on. So that's, that's, that's what we're hoping to cover. Uh, I'm assuming that there'll be all sorts of uh, experience in the room. Love you to kind of chip in with, you know, we learned this or whatever as, as we go through. Okay, great. Um, why work with, with others? I, this, this seems uh, so obvious, but actually really worth just starting here. Uh, we work with others because, because it's, it's, it's how God chooses to, to, to work most fundamentally. Um, God is Trinity. He is one and many. Um, and, and as human beings, we are created for community, for interdependence, inter interaction. Uh, and as human beings, we're made with limits. We are not designed to be self-sufficient. Um, we are designed to need others uh, and, and to grow and to operate and to achieve things in community with, with others. Of course, that applies and is spelt out in all sorts of detail to us as, as, as the church, uh, as, as, as members of, of our churches. Um, but I think that applies equally to organizations, Christian organizations. Um, we bring together different roles, different gifts, but we have the same purpose which is, which is gospel fruitfulness. So the secular world knows that um, partnership is an absolutely essential strategy to achieve certain kinds of things. We've got an even deeper and stronger uh, motive for, for partnering. Um, and, and in fact, our, our, um, in so far as we perhaps drive to achieve everything ourselves on our own as organizations, a sort of world domination strategy, we might just be getting something wrong. So we'll, we'll, we'll spell that out uh, in, in, a, in a little bit more detail. Because one of the places that partnership is mentioned uh, in, in a very explicit way uh, in the New Testament, we don't, we don't have sort of corporate partnerships quite. We could work through Acts and pick out some sort of the inter-church uh, uh, support and, and fellowship and, and, and so on. But there's a particular mention of partnership um, between Paul and the Philippians. So as you'll be really familiar, he writes in Philippians chapter one, uh, verse three, I thank my God each time I remember you in all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work, it's God's work, he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion uh, in Christ Jesus. This is Paul beginning to recognize the limits of his own ministry and saying it's going to carry on because, 
because partnership, because that's what God, God will achieve it through different people in different ways at different times. And we'd, pay, we'd do well to pay attention to that as organizational leaders as, as well. We don't have a right uh, to exist. We don't have a right to achieve everything we set our hearts on. Uh, we, we are made to, to, to look to others. Um, and, and, and then he goes on, of course, in chapter two, you'll be so familiar with this as, as well, the, the, um, the spirit, uh, the attitude, the posture of, of partnership. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, so it starts with being in Christ. It's not partnership between you and me. It's actually our unity in Christ, mm -hmm. our union with Christ that is the start of it all. If you've read Bonhoeffer's Life Together, that's the, that's the premise of the whole thing. If any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, uh, having the same love, being in one in spirit of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Now, how I wish when I was working on some big strategic alliances that I could have worked through this passage with some of, of the leaders uh, that, 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 I, that I got to work with. Because here we, here we have the, the, the model for, for, for how, we, how we partner. Um, it's, it's, it's there in, in our whole um, identity as, as Christian, Christian people. So there's a, there's a big motive. Um, right at the sort of top level of, of our understanding of what it is to be uh, God's creatures. Um, nonetheless, we do have to make some wise decisions. We can't partner with everything, with, with everyone on, it, on everything. So we, we do have to make some, some decisions. And so as leaders, um, when we're trying to achieve a new outcome or develop a new capability or add capacity to our, to our organization or our ministry, um, there are Broadly, three strategies, very simplistically put. We can make it, uh, we can buy it, or we can partner. Uh, we can make it, we can do it ourselves. Um, and, and that's often, if we, can, if we can fund and resource it, that's often the simplest uh, way of doing it. It's not necessarily the most gospel fruit, fruit, fruitful, but uh, it is um, practically very, very simple. Uh, we can commission somebody else. Uh, we can buy we can buy the capability in, uh, and and that's absolutely a, a you know a fair strategy for for some things uh, that that we will want and need uh, to do. But there are there's also the option to partner with others to to do it, it jointly. Um, and I will say from having spent many years um, working through the challenges of people running partnerships, that it is inherently more challenging than doing it yourself. Um, but actually, the direct route. Who, who was in the, the um, plenary last night? I mean, you know, the direct route is not the route that God chooses to take us. He often takes us through harder routes. And sometimes, doing doing um, a ministry, pursuing a ministry goal in collaboration with others might be harder, but might actually have more more gospel fruit. Um, but we do need to be clear, nonetheless, on a compelling case uh, for why to do it. Uh, but it, it can bring significant rewards. So there's a whole wisdom thing going on, on the fundamental choice to partner, um, which, which as leaders we're, we're, we're often faced with, with having to take. So, so we've decided we need a partnership to achieve something. Um, we might rush to think, who can we partner with and how do we set this up? Let's pause and stop and say, actually, we need to be fit to partner, we actually have to make sure that we as an organization are in a healthy uh, state, in a healthy condition, uh, and, and make sure that we set ourselves up well to be a good partner to, to, to others. So here are some of the, the, the questions or, or areas that um, I would um, encourage working through, have worked through with, with different organizations, asking really hard questions not rushing through these questions, it takes, you know, it takes a bit of time and discussion and reflection and analysis. What sort of um, partner will be a good fit with our vision and mission and strategy? Have we got a really clearly defined reason for doing this that is, is consistent with, with our overall uh, objectives? Um, have we weighed up alternative ways to doing this? I've seen a lot of partnerships that have come about because um, two chief executives are mates. 
Ever seen one of those? Um, you know, he went to school or university with him, um, and, uh, and, and therefore we're going to kind of partner these, these organizations. Um, there, is some, there is some strength and merit in having good relationships, but that's not a basis for a strong, a strong partnership. So um, we do need to consider, are there, are there other routes uh, that we could go down, other ways we could achieve our goal? And then there's a lot of internal soul searching that we should be doing as organizations. We're asking other people to work, work with us if we're going to try and minimize the, the, the friction um, and the, the angst that, that, that often goes with, with some of these strategic relationships. Um, uh, here, are, here are some questions uh, you might think of, of, of others. So have we really um, considered how important this relationship, this potential relationship is uh, to us? So, and, and, and is it, does it hold an equivalent importance to the organization that we're proposing to partner with? If it's really important to us, but not very important to them, that's, it's not a reason not to proceed, but it's really worth being aware of that as you go into it, because uh, therein lie uh, a lot of uh, hassles and, and, uh, and a bit of pain usually. Do the key decision makers uh, really support this? So um, it, 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 depending on what level the kind of momentum to partner comes from, the board may think this is a great idea, but you know, has the chief exec and the executive leadership signed, signed into it, or the, the chief exec thinks it's a great idea, but the board is, is not on board. Not a good idea. You really do need to take time. And if people are pushing back and resisting, you're mad not to pay attention to the source of that resistance. It doesn't mean it, it rules the decision out, but to work through the, the, the hesitation, to work through the reluctance, uh, will teach you an awful lot about what people are worried about or what people are hoping for, uh, what else people know that they haven't voiced. Perhaps they may know something about the situation or the other partner uh, and so on. So really driving out the, the, the level of support for the key decision makers. And then taking time to think through what are our strengths and weaknesses. Um, and we don't, you know, we, we normally think we're great, <laughs> um, and wouldn't, why wouldn't they want to partner with us? But actually, if we can get really honest about our strengths and weaknesses, it makes us a better partner because it says, "I'm going to be much more receptive to their help on whatever it might be." So, uh, for example, if our organisation is not very good at systems and processes. Um, uh, then it's going to make us very receptive to, to their input, their help um, on uh, systems and processes, uh, for, for instance. If we're really rubbish at spiritual formation uh, as an organization, then working with a partner who's going to challenge and stretch us um, will we'll be much more receptive uh, to that. And instead of just seeing that as a kind of source of tension, we'll see it as a valued difference. Um, and so we only get to that if we've been really honest uh, about our strengths and weaknesses. Are we really clear about what we bring to the relationship? We know what we want from them, but what are, what are we actually bringing, bringing to, to the table here? Um, and what, what is it that we, we need from them? It's astonishing the, the number of times that people enter into partnerships without having worked through some of these, these quite sort of core, core questions. And so we kind of go into it because it seemed like a good idea because there was a big goal, a really big, compelling goal. Uh, but, but in fact, um, you know, there are a whole lot of, things about the respective organization, about our organization that we haven't really thought through or even, even understood um, that, that, that is worth working, for, working through. So that's the kind of doing our, doing our work on ourselves, getting, getting fit to be uh, a, a good um, collaborative, um, unselfish, uh, generous partner uh, in the whole thing. And then there's a whole set of conversations that we need to be willing to have together uh, usually as kind of joint leadership teams. Um, uh, one of the interesting questions is actually who's coming to the table to discuss this? Um, one of the things I've learned is that if there are key faces missing in these conversations, pay attention to that because often that person's not there because they don't think this is a good idea, but they might have significant influence which can really become grit uh, into, into the, the relationship. But jointly to be able to say, uh, with, with, a, with a really common kind of strong um, commitment, what is it that we can achieve together that we couldn't achieve separately? Uh, that's a very important question to be able to answer well. And also just the kind of the, the realism test, the press to test, is there, is there genuinely 
a realistic chance of achieving outcomes or benefits that are going to justify the effort and the cost because the, there is effort and cost in stepping into this relationship, making the relationship where it's going to take a lot of management time and attention to make it work. So what, what, are, the, what are the outcomes and benefits and are they really genuinely worth, worth the effort and, and, and the cost? And, you know, sometimes you're not going to be able to completely answer that, but you need to have explored that uh, pretty honestly uh, between, between you. Um, assessing the appetite for partnership. So where does this partnership fit in our respective organizations? Um, somebody once sort of asked me about a particular project, is this too big to fail? Um, in, in other words, um, is it so small and insignificant to that organization that they'd happily just jettison it, um, in which case that's not a good idea to, to, to go down this, this route. So it's the, it's the kind of relative scale of importance um, to, to the respective organizations. Um, and, and will it get enough leadership time and, and attention? So what, what else are the, the key leaders working on at the moment? Where does this fit in their personal order of priorities? Um, have we got similar levels of, of commitment to, to one another uh, on that front? And then I, I have to say, I don't think I've ever, this, this question of assessing each other I would love to know of good examples where Christian organizations may have done that because I haven't seen this done um, deliberately and intentionally in a Christian context, which is not to say it hasn't been done. I just haven't, haven't seen that. I have to say it's a huge thing that gets done in the private sector. There's, there's real kind of mutual due diligence uh, that organizations do, not just on the kind of finances and the, the um, practical capability, but, but actually on values, um, uh, capacity, performance, um, you know, is there honesty about strength and weakness? Who are the key people who are going to be actually running the project or whatever it, it is? And, and are they reliable and credible? What's the chemistry like, like between them? So, you know, if we, um, if we think this is a really important kingdom purpose that we're engaging with here, then we should be willing to have quite difficult conversations around some of these. And then in some of the um, some of the client organisations I've worked with in the past, this this can be a, a massive, um, really intense process because because it is too big to fail, mm -hmm. um, and and they really invest uh, in in it, um, uh, you know because because we're Christian people, we kind of assume we're all going to be kind of nice and and mm -hmm. and so on. I'm really stereotyping badly there, aren't I? But um, you know there, there is a kind of we, we're all willless to succeed, but we're often not looking the whites of the eyes. Um, and, and thinking, thinking, thinking those questions through. And then having done that, we need a formal framework. Um, uh, it sounds terribly obvious, but it's so often missing in, in some of the sort of informal kind of collaborations that come about. And we would, we would serve each other quite well, I think, to have even quite simple um, goals, structure, commercial arrangements, if they apply, you know, who, who, who contributes what, who takes what out, who owns what IP, um, who's giving what in terms of time, um, uh, and, and, and so on, so that the expectations are, are really clear. Um, some organizations do this brilliantly, but it's often just sort of left to a sort of vague shake of the hands. And you know, guess what? People move on to come back to trying to unpick this years later. And if, it, if any of you have ever inherited a partnership uh, from, a, from a predecessor and you find yourself uh, sitting trying to sort of work out what, what was meant to happen and who was meant to be responsible for what. It's horrific to try and unpick later if it's not written down. Um, it's not to say we don't trust each other, it's just that we're human and you know, we, we, need, we need clarity. Um, and another area that seems a very strange thing to think about right from the beginning, but, but actually are there exit routes? So can we, can we see a way we could end this well um, when, if and when the time comes? So, you know, we might have to end it not so well because things don't work out, but, but actually is there, a, is there a positive exit route uh, from this? Are we always going to build, build in this dependency? Perhaps it's leading to a merger of the two organizations or a takeover of one organization. Might be hard to acknowledge if, if that's really what's going on. Um, but actually we don't always think about what the, what the kind of exit, exit route uh, is. Uh, my own organization was created as a, as, a, as a joint venture between two entities. Um, and you know the intention was that we would grow up um, and and become independent, which is which is is what has has happened. Um, but if if either of the founding partners had wanted to kind of grip and hold on to it, 
um, that would have become hugely problematic for, for the health of the organisation. So lots of questions to think about as you're kind of thinking about going into, into partnerships. That's some of the forethought, if you like, the, the thinking you do before uh, really jumping, jumping into it. What I'm going to move on to now is just to walk you through this as a very, very simple model. Um, I think it's in the handout um, that, that you've got on the, on the app. Um, this was something that a colleague and I developed when some of our clients were saying, look, you know, I can see all the things going wrong in my, in my partnerships. Um, but tell me what good looks like. It was almost a kind of desperate, desperate plea of tell me what good looks like. And we reviewed all the partnerships that we'd done and a whole big literature review. Um, and, and this was kind of how we, how we drew that insight together. And I'll take you through the components of this. You might want to have in your mind a particular partnership that you are currently working on or involved with. You're welcome to kind of do this as a, as a little live um, self self-evaluation uh, exercise uh, as we go um, on, on this. So the first thing that we start with, which is really what part of what we've been talking about in the, the preparation, is the need to have aligned values and mutual, mutual goals. So we, we, we must be clear that there's something we're jointly trying to uh, achieve together um, that, that aligns. We will also have different goals from each other. So as well as the mutual goals, we might have some very different goals and actually knowing and understanding and appreciating those and over time, as the partnership runs, um, staying up to date with how those goals might be changing um, is a really important thing to do. And, and, and keeping on checking whether the mutual goals remain aligned with, with one another. It's, it's very easy for that to kind of go out of sync. You know, one ministry um, you know, is, is sort of developing in this way and this has suddenly become less important. Um, so, so having and maintaining a sense of the, the goal alignment, the values alignment, and so on. So um, having a regular check-in um, on this with key leaders uh, involved in the partnership would be a really good thing in your kind of one-to-one, -one, your, uh, you know, just two, two people, just, you know, how's this working for you is a really important conversation. Is this still as important as it was a year ago? Um, uh, that, that sort of conversation. So a regular check-in on, on that. So that's the very the center the hub of the wheel. The rim of the wheel, the bit that sort of holds everything uh, together and, and in, in healthy tension is the agreement uh, that we have uh, between us. Um, you know, what, what are the, what, what's the deal really? Um, who's bringing what uh, to, to this uh, party? Um, uh, does, you know, what, what are we each needing uh, to get out of it? Um, sometimes seems like not a very Christian que question, but actually important. You know, we, we need this out of it because it feeds this other part of our ministry over here, whatever it might be. Um, you know, what we need out of it might be the growth of our leaders. It might not be something kind of tangible or, or monetized, um, but, but, being, but, but understanding, um, you know, who's contributing what, who's needing what, uh, all of that sort of thing. And again, needing to be uh, revisited and reviewed uh, ev every so often. And as I said, having, having those things written down, I think is a very, very wise uh, path of, of action. Um, even the best relationships come under, come under strain or priority shift. And it and, uh, doesn't mean you can never change them just because they were written down. It just means you know what you're changing from rather than saying, well, you didn't say uh, that sort of thing. Um, and then working around the spokes of the wheel, um, working on the, you know, being clear on leadership and, and in particular um, how, how the leadership of the, the respective organizations, if we're talking organizationally, how will the leadership of the respective organizations relate uh, to one another? When will, when will the leadership um, who are not directly involved in the project come together to review and oversee and encourage and, 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 and steer? Uh, the, the, the project, who's, who's really setting the direction um, on our joint project, those, those sorts, of, sorts of questions. And closely linked to that at the opposite end is the team structure and role. So who's doing what uh, to achieve this project and being really clear because if you're taking team members from different entities, they're often not as aware of each other's roles, positions, pressures, all of those kind of things. So you've got to be more explicit about a lot of these things than you even have to be in a single single organization. Um, and make sure that people know each other, make sure that people understand those responsibilities. Um, uh, entire um, sort of disastrous um, uh, situations 
have offered that I've I've been been helped to mediate in have actually sprung out of people just not having an understanding of who's meant to be responsible and so blame starts and, and, and so on. So very, very easy problem to avoid if we're clear on the team structure. And then and close to that is how we communicate. Who, you know, what, what are going to be the, the roots? Um, how, how, how often will what meetings happen, for instance? Will we have a whole, you know, will everybody get together every so often? Or, you know, will there be a weekly email that updates everybody? Or who, who are the, the stakeholders outside of this? And, and who's communicating with them so they don't get mixed messages from, from one, or, one or the other side and, and so on? Uh, decision making. So how will how will decision making work? Who who is mandated and delegated um, with the ability to make key decisions? Um, what decisions have to come to some sort of joint body, some joint leadership team, uh, or, or whatever it may, or, or will be? What are our expectations about the parameters? What are the what are the kind of um, criteria that we might apply uh, for for decision making? Um, one of the UK's most successful infrastructure projects was um, was part of an, uh, an, an airport. Um, uh, it was one of the very, very few such projects that was delivered on time, on budget, uh, and, and, and very successfully uh, d delivered. In fact, they came in under budget, which is kind of unheard of. And one of the decision-making rules they had is that if a problem comes up during a day's construction, if it's reported and logged in a particular way by 6 p.m. on that day, then the cost of solving the problem would be a whole project cost. And if it wasn't reported that day, but left over hidden or left over for a day or a week or whatever, then the company whose problem it was paid for fixing the problem. And what an incredibly clever incentive that was, because it mean, meant that problems were just coming out straight away as they happened, and people were on them. And it meant that there was a central team who could quickly replan and say, OK, so we poured the wrong kind of concrete here today. That, that happens. Um, poured the wrong kind of concrete here today, which means that the uh, construction equipment that was supposed to come in and do the next thing can't work there, which means we can put it over there and carry on with that bit while we fix that problem. And that was how they achieved um, such a such a dramatic outcome. Now, I'm not sure what what our equivalent of that is. <laughs> if you if you're thinking of an equivalent example in, in Christian ministry, I'd love to know. But I just think it's a great story. <laughs> build a church on the rock. Please. <laughs> build your church. On, build your build your build your house on the rock. Um, <laughs> somebody was going to come in with a question. No. Oh, okay, I thought I thought I saw that saw a hand, um, but uh, just a just a sort of fun example and a real example of you know the right kind of decision making can make a huge a huge difference. We don't talk about this a lot in Christian ministry, but we should. Just systems, processes, protocols, that sort of thing. You know what are what are the policies um, uh, and and key processes? Uh, you know, for example, we want to bring somebody new into the project. How are we going to do that? Um, uh, what you know we we um, we, we're going to have um, uh, what, what sort of um, IT platform are we going to uh, use? Should we set up a shared Google Drive, or we're we going to use one or the other system from one of the respective organisations? Or what's going to enable the best uh, collaboration uh, here? Um, and, and to make intentional decisions about that, rather than just allowing the geekiest person to run off and kind of do the version that they want, which is often what happens. So. Um, conflict resolution is on here. Now, that may be surprising. I intentionally put conflict resolution on here because guess what? Conflict does happen. <laughs> um, and so instead of kind of wishing it didn't happen, let's rather assume that it, it can happen, it may happen, um, and have some agreement about, you know, if we disagree on things, how do, how do we want to deal with that? So that example, actually, um, the, the construction project I, I talked about, they also had a very quick escalation uh, process. So, you know, the, the idea that if, you know, if we hit a, a big disagreement between a couple of contractors, um, here was the process it would go through. Um, and many other partnerships I've worked on would have that. Now, we're often not dealing with those kind of really complex projects in, in ministry. But to say, uh, look, you know, we're going, to, we're going to agree that if, you know, if we hit some sort of significant roadblock, within the week, uh, with, you know, within a week, we will make sure that the two chief executives have had um, you know, a, a, a high-level type of conversation to to help move it forward, or wh whatever the, the the equivalent is, um, or you know, our elderships are going to get together um, if we hit significant tension or roadblocks, 
um, and, and have a meal together and work it through um, uh, together uh, as relationally as, as possible. Those would be the kind of policies or pro, um, principles that you could apply to conflict resolution. And then building in evaluation improvement, um, intentionally saying how, you know, asking, actively asking the question, um, what's working and what, what could be improved, uh, just gives you momentum. Uh, it, it lowers the bar. It means that before things become a major problem, we've probably picked up on them because somebody said, this could be better or this is not quite working, if we're doing fairly regular uh, kind of evaluation and, and improvement. Um, so uh, we, we, have a, we have a partnership to provide accreditation for our seminary program, and we just have quarterly meetings uh, with the key person on, on the other side to say, are we doing everything right? Um, are you getting what you need from us? Um, we, we tell them if we're not getting what we need from you know, it's just a, and, and so it's expected that there will be improvement as opposed to waiting for there to be a, a frustration and a, and a problem. So what I haven't talked about is um, uh, the space in the middle. Sorry, I've got this all in the wrong order. Where, where's culture in all of this? And really, uh, culture is in a sense what you get as a result of the way you do all of these things. So culture is, culture is actually, in, in this metaphor, just the space between the wheels. So this is not to say you can't be intentional about culture. You can be very intentional about culture, but you don't do culture, you get culture from doing these various things in certain ways, how you communicate, how you make decisions, uh, and, and all of that kind of thing. So that's, that's how culture works. I wanted to just take you through this. So great little trust equation. Uh, somebody called Charles Green came up with it, and I just think it's a wonderful basis for a conversation. So it's a quotient, and for those of you who are mathematically minded, you will know that um, what happens below the line the denominator, the bottom, has a disproportionately high effect on the total. So you can have very high credibility, reliability, and intimacy. I'll explain what those are. But if your self-orientation is also high, that really undermines trust. By credibility, uh, we mean uh, the the um, the capability, the the skills, the ability. You know the the capacity to do the thing. You know, we know that you can do it. Reliability says is is where you do what you say you're going to do. Can I can I rely on you to do what you say you're going to do? You might be really good at this thing, but if I can't rely on you to get things done when you said, that's a real problem in making this relationship work. And then the intimacy relates to our knowledge of each other as organizations and as leaders. So you know one question would be if I'm partnering with an organization, have I taken the trouble to know what really drives them? Am I able, when I'm not sitting in front of them, am I able to anticipate what they might care about as I'm making a decision that might affect them? Because I've taken the trouble to, to, to know and understand their, their, their drives and, and concerns as, as an organization. Do I know how things are changing for them, what threats they feel or what opportunities they're after and that, that sort of thing. So caring about them as, as an organization and, and as leaders. And of course, the self-orientation, I can do all of that well, but if I'm ultimately acting and seem to be acting in a way that serves my best interests um, uh, rather than the, 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 the bigger purpose for which we're doing this, um, well, Philippians 2, 3, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Um, we know that that undermines uh, relationships and trust very, very quickly. So great, great, little, great little equation. Um, uh, even, even working with teams, you know, so I can, I can have a conversation with my team about this to say in terms of the, the churches we serve, um, are, we, are we really showing up as credible? Are we proving reliable? Are we bothering to get to know them? And are we seen to be acting in, in the, the interests of their, their purposes and ministries? Uh, then, then they will trust us. I'm not going to dwell on this very much. If this is of interest to you, I'm really happy to send you a copy of this. You, this wouldn't work for you, but it's an illustration of something you could do. So um, I have had a number of clients who said, I'd like to be able to kind of assess um, the, 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 the health of our partners. I'd like to get a few people to kind of comment on it. And what we did was we took each of those. So that says um, mutual objectives and goals, leadership, team structure, and so on. And we came up with descriptions for what it would look like as we were just getting going 
as it was developing, if we were performing well, and as we moved towards towards excelling. And it's not it's not a linear trajectory. It's not a given that you're always moving in the, in that direction. But we got people to to kind of scale where they thought the the, the relationship was, and, and we did this every six months over a few years. Um, and sometimes the numbers actually went down rather than than up. But the point was it was giving people a way to describe what they saw happening, so that the leadership could pay attention to the health of the partnership. So really the point is, um, if it's a big and strategic partnership, or maybe even you want to think about this way on quite small intimate partnerships, um, it might be really helpful to come up with a way that you could measure it. So as I say, this is just a worked example. It, it, you'd have to come up with, with your own, but we created this matrix. So, um, and then just to say uh, leading partnerships is challenging. Um, I, what I, one of the things I noticed was that um, because you're not leading within the kind of authority bounds of, your, of a single organization where people know you, understand your role, um, and so on, it takes a kind of next level leadership to lead particularly a complex partnership really well. Um, and here are a few things that stood out to us as we worked with different groups over, over the years. So um, let me just, um, so SCAN is a kind of intellectual um, breadth, um, the, the ability to see beyond uh, my own organization's boundaries, the, beginning, be, the ability to see beyond these issues here and to realize that what I do um, and the decisions I make might knock on um, into, into a wider, wider sphere. And so you're kind of looking for a, for a breadth of thinking um, that, that perhaps um, isn't as exposed or as needed in a, in a single uh, organization. You need the ability to relate well across boundaries. And in particular, there's a lot of influencing that's needed to lead a partnership well, because you often trying to get people to do things and to participate in, in ways that you don't have any authority over them in, in structural terms. And so it's kind of next level influencing. Uh, that's, that's often going on when it works well. And you need the ability to act across boundaries. So um, having, the, having the kind of tools and um, uh, frameworks for um, and, and um, ex execution confidence, if you like, to get things done across boundaries. Again, you know, I haven't got all the, the normal levers, and I hate that sort of mechanistic metaphor, but you know, I haven't got all the normal means at my disposal that I know how to work within my own organization. I've actually got to work out how to get things to happen in another organization. Um, and, and that takes a certain kind of, of intelligence. And so at the heart of this, there's lots of emotional in, intelligence that's going on uh, for, 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 um, for partnership leaders. Um, so there are, there are some of the, the uh, explanations uh, in that. 